Welcome to Project Comedy, a podcast by and for military veterans doing stand-up comedy, turning military banter into quality stand-up comedy acts. We might be veterans, but our comedy aims to get everybody laughing. Us veterans had a protected life during our service. Forget white privilege, we had military privilege. In my early career, a bloke used to wake me up with a cuppa. At least that's what we used to call it in the Navy. But we all did. I mean, free sports, planned social lives, cheap beer, and the mythical busload of nurses. Awesome. Unless you were a military nurse. Imagine their disappointment when they met me, Gabe, and Jamie. But something that surprised us in Project Comedy is a number of people that have said, yeah, I want to do comedy. I want to take the piss out of those flaky civvies. Well, if that's your objective, sorry, folks, I've got two disappointing bits of news for you. One, if you're not serving now, you're a civvy. Two, the audience you're trying to make laugh, guess what? They're civvies too. But transition is hard. Trust me, these knickers are killing me. But here's the reality. Step on the stand-up circuit and you're entertaining civvies. You're also going to be one of the very few veterans taken to the stage, unless it's a Project Comedy Zoom show. So honestly, what's it like gigging with civvies? What do the civvy comics think of us? To answer those questions or ignore them, because I know these people far too well, I'm joined by my fellow Project Comedy ambassadors, Gabriel Murphy, a true Irishman. He'll never be a civilian. He'll fight the arms of an Englishman's oppression unless that Englishman happens to be very good looking. Jamie Johnson, next to no transition was required. He was RAF after all. Resettlement for him was a handout telling him that travel lodges actually cost money and you can't get a free upgrade to a four star because you wear a chip bag on your head. And I'm Jay Saunders, the man that's been sold to stop referring to his assistance dog as his valet. More importantly, we're joined by a dear mate of mine, a comedian on the South Coast circuit, a new booker, and has some amazing stories about OnlyFans and Disney. Those stories are actually disconnected, by the way. Pip Harris and our mate from the Northeast, comedian, booker, and former RAC wannabe, sorry, sorry, former RAF regiment serviceman, Jordy Laws. Pip, Jordy, (laughs) welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Hey, guys. And before we get into um, the real body conversation, I just want to check in with uh, Gabe and Jamie, because Jamie, you actually went out and did your gig number, what was it? Gig number four. Yes, it was. And how was it? It was It was great. Yeah, it was at the, the Holly Bush in Craig Lee, the, uh, the mecca of the Midlands for comedy, apparently. It was really good. Um, it was different to the last gig. But uh, it, I, I felt like I'd, I'd have made a marked improvement since my last gig. So that's little progress. So I'm happy with that. And uh, obviously, let's get into the meat and potatoes of it, because we've got two brilliant guests in with us. We'll start off with you, Pip, because obviously, right. So and I'll point out to the listeners, Pip, civilian through and through, albeit you have encountered and worked with us military types before, uh, Jord at service menu yourself but on the comedy circuit so it enables us to get it from both perspectives rather than just from uh, the project uh, comedy side of life pip tell us something about you know tell us something about your comedy career and if you really want to be that bad you could point out what it was like meeting me or more importantly meeting the dog tell us something about your comedy well um so firstly you know thanks for having me on guys um so yeah my my comedy career kind of <laughs> it kind of it started by accident to be brutally honest um a friend of ours who's on the circuit here in um the south coast was going through a really really bad time of it um to the point where those of us who were their friends were taking turns spending time with them so as they didn't do something i decided that i was going to um use a cover of I want to get back in I want to get into the comedy scene um to go to shows with them to be the person and my bluff got called so right. um, I ended up jumping on and fortunately fell uh, fell in love with it and went on from there and you and I have done several gigs together um we haven't mentioned it before on the podcast but I'd like you to tell the story because it's a good 
example of where where relationships need to be. Um, the legend that was the Shepherd's Crook. Um, can you just recall what the Shepherd's Crook gig was like? Right. Trying to think how best to describe this. this so I, to say the Shepherd's Crook was a bad gig is to say, you know, he's the nicest guy in prison. Um, <laughs> the gig itself was really badly promoted. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to go into that element. When he actually comes to the gig, it was, I think it was the week before Christmas. Um, yeah. Yeah, the week yeah. before Christmas, and it's the f and it was the f first. And pubs were open after the year that was a nightmare. We'd only recently come out of a bloody lockdown, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, and pretty much most of the pub were in there for like work stews, which normally would be a great fodder for comedians, but they stuck us to the far end of the pub, away from everyone else. Um, and as soon, pretty much as soon as we started, anyone who was in, who would be in our direct line of sight, buggered off further away. Um, the host of the show has a very combative style on stage. I think that's a polite way of putting mm -hmm. it. Um, yeah. The other way of putting it would be every time she opened her mouth, I was worried a bottle was going to come flying out of red. Um, and yeah, it basically was a case of we had to fight to get the to get an audience, it wasn't that we were fighting to get get the audience's attention. We had to fight to get them to be an audience. So we it was basically a, it was it was, it was a like joy of the even the bar staff wouldn't turn off the jukebox uh, for us. No, so they, we were actually shouting over the jukebox as well. Yeah, we were shouting over the jukebox. We had um, we were we were struggling with ad hoc mic and PA. Um, had what had to be referred to a, a, um, a comedian who has in, continuously to be referred to as the Russian woman, um, which is usually a kiss of death for any show. Um, yeah. And yeah, basically, I think we all just kind of looked at him and went, you know what, sod it. Let's just throw our material out. Let's have a giggle. Let's make each other laugh. Because um, as every single one will know, the hardest gig is to comedians. Mm -hmm. if, if you've got a joke that hits and the, and the boys are laughing, and I say that as a colloquial, not as in, you know, but yeah. um, if the, you've got the boys laughing, you've got a good joke. You know, the punters will get will like it as well. Um, so we were just trying to get each other going and trying to crack each other. And that was, a, and I think it's one of the most important relationships you need to build in comedy is, it's building it with your other with your fellow comedians because that's where you're going to get additional tips advice about gigs uh, links into other gigs and that night we just spent the night trying to make each other laugh especially when um steer suddenly decided to do i think that's the best set i've ever seen steer do because instead of doing his step with a microphone he led down on a sofa on the very front of the stage and was just talking to himself. And we were just killing ourselves that he didn't give a monkeys. I, I still remember at one point, um, three rather drunken ladies started singing along to some song on the mute, um, jukebox, and he just sat there waving um, the microphone like a baton. You know, it, it worked. It's very much in the moment. And yeah, I don't think, I don't think ever we'll be able to duplicate that. But yeah, um, it was... It's one of those gigs that will never be again. If I jump jump across to introduce you, George, um, tell us something about um, number one, your military service. Uh, but what brought you into comedy? Um, what's your comedy career been to date? <clears throat> so I joined the RAF regiment um, sixteen and a half as soon as I could. Really uh, went through my basic training. Uh, got deployed to Afghan at eighteen, and done a tour of Afghan over there for six months. It was, I know people say that it, like the RAF regiment, don't do this and don't do that, but we got chucked in right at the deep end on the MERT team, the medical emergency response team. So we were picking up all the casualties that were getting blown up, shot, killed, injured. So it was quite hard as an 18 year old to get chucked into that. Came back six months, turn around, pre-deployment training again, back out to Afghan again. And after that, 
it was like four years at this point, and I thought, right, I'm done. So I left. Um, long story short, bounced around with a lot of jobs, and then got to two or three, three years ago to the day, more or less, and all the PTSD just kicked in big time. Mm-hmm. I had everything that you could imagine. I had a lot of money from my job working offshore on the oil rigs. I had a family, perfect relationship, loads of mates, and it just wasn't worth anything. And I thought, what have I always wanted to do? So I've done a bit of soul searching. I know this is like a Britain's Got Talent fucking sub story, yeah? but um, oh, mate, of- I'll, I'll, I'll put some special music on in the background for this bit. <laughs> yeah, please, yeah. <laughs> Violins work well with this. Um, and then I just thought I'd give comedy a go and went to an open mic night. Didn't realize I got on the wrong night. So there was a woman on before me and she started like, she stood up on stage and she was like, sunlight, it burns. I am here, but you don't see me. And I was like, what is going on here? And it was what? a spoken, it was a spoken word and poetry night. So then <laughs> oh, <fuck> obviously, <laughs> so obviously I jumped up and I was like, how are you doing knobheads? Like you're ready for a bit of comedy. And then like it went down as well as you'd imagine. And so after that, I just got the bug for it. Like most people had quit, but to be honest with you, I, I started my own nights because I thought I can do this like myself. And I've always been good at like talking to people and saying what I wanted. So I started emceeing my own nights after probably about six months. And every night I've done so far has been sold out. I've now got a monthly MC spot at a theatre, which is 300 seat capacity. Which Holy get, I've got, cow. I've got, Yeah, so I've got that on Wednesday. Uh, I got a call the other day to go and gig with uh, Danny Postel off Britain's Got Talent. So he took me through at one of his gigs and I've done a spot mm-hmm. there. And it's, to be honest, it's just blown up. Like, like, it's got bigger and bigger and I've got bigger and bigger venues. So I've now got like six or seven venues, one of them being the 300 seater. And it just, it just came naturally to me. And, but to be honest with you, if I hadn't have gone into comedy, again, cue the violin music, um, I probably would be dead because... Uh, I thought I had nothing else to live for. I was struggling so much. And then a point that I missed here, actually, um, I started to think, again, without sounding like a knob, I didn't need the money. I didn't do the comedy for the money because I had enough from my job what I was wearing offshore. So I just started looking for people that needed help on Facebook. And there was a guy that committed suicide, a teacher from Darlington, and his family couldn't afford to pay for part of his funeral. So I put on a gig. Raised four thousand pounds, sold out three hundred tickets, um, paid for his headstone, and then done another gig and raised another two thousand pounds and for men's mental health for a charity called Man Health, and it's just blown up from there to be honest. And now I'm doing like it's a bit like imposter syndrome. Like I stand on the stage now on Wednesday, I'm going to walk out in front of probably a hundred and fifty people. I'm going to come out to Ozzy Osbourne crazy train because I am a bit crazy, and then like <laughs> I've got like seven pro comedians that are coming on with us and it's just started from not having anything else like i got to the point where i had everything that every man would want i was financially secure i was stable i had a great life but something was missing and if i can get on that stage and tell every single person in that room that no matter what you feel like it does always get better and it saves one person's life then to me that's worth more than going and doing and please mate please mate don't think that you're um, you're playing violins or something anybody that's been listening to this podcast for a while know why we got into it um i have found it amazing recovery for myself i mean and yeah. you know gabe and jamie will tell you the stories and bits and pieces if it weren't for a project comedy if it weren't for me doing stand i would not be alive um yeah. i'm very lucky i survived my last suicide attempt last year and the way i survived it was straight after i was released from hospital um, I was forced back into gigging again. Um, we all suffer with mental health issues of one form or another. It's outstanding the recovery you can get from stand-up, not just the performing, even just yeah. the writing of your material can do amazing things for you, can do absolutely amazing things for you. Okay, let's talk yeah. about civvies. Let's talk about civvies. I'll start off with sure. you, Jordan, and then I'll bring it back into you, Pip. When you were starting your stand-up Maybe. career, but when you were starting your stand-up career, did you have a sense of it's them and us? Are they going to be able to survive first contact with military humour? Or were you thinking of civvies as a different form of human being? Or Because we, we had a very close nature where you could get away with saying 
fucking anything. What did you find you were editing yourself or worrying about what the audience were going to think about your humor? I think, I think to be honest, right, there's a broad, a broad spectrum here, and the difference between civvies and them woke snowflakey civvies is very, very defined. So, like, found when I, I was breaking into the circuit, a lot of people didn't quite agree with how I conducted myself, like on a stage because I'd say whatever I wanted and it was comedy. So if I went on there and took the mick out of someone that heckled me, then I didn't care whether they were civvy, whether they'd done 10 tours of Afghan or not. It was just, I think civvies constantly think that you're a threat to them because you've got this like, you've got this sort of no bullshit, no holds barred sort of attitude. And it does come back and bite you in the ass sometimes, but also some of the civvies that I've met are some of the most nicest, respectable, welcoming audiences that you could imagine. Uh, and and acts but then on the flip side you've also got the ones that are just it's like they're waiting for you to trip up so they can be like you can't say that did you say he and you were meant to say she it's like it's hard do you know what I mean it, it, I don't think civvies definitely separates that I think it's just the type of person there's an example of that I've gone through myself George um, when I did the semi-finals of the uh, South Coast Comedian of the Year I was really quite nervous. I'd just come back from uh, a recovery weekend. I'd been trying out uh, for the Invictus Games. Um, so I'd been up in Lillishaw, had to get back down south to Fairham to perform for the um, semi-final night. I was nervous enough as it was, but one of the other acts, he was an anti-war campaigner. The second he found out I was military and had PTSD, he would not leave me alone. He was asking me multiple questions about war crimes and how many have I seen and how many did I commit? Um, and I wasn't, you know, I got through the performance. I did all right. The bit that really bit my backside was he got through to the final. He was gamesmanshipping me. He suddenly realised, right, if I can knock his game, then it will take me further. And I think it's it's very true, exactly what you just said. It's different people. It's not a difference between civvies and military. It's some people are good, some people are assholes. And you've just got to be able to identify, you know, which ones you're actually dealing with that day. Yes, yeah, see, see when you get, like, I, I don't know what stage everyone's at in the circuit, but when you start getting to, like, like I'm doing paid spots and when people are, see you as a threat they'll try any way that they can to knock you to knock your confidence if it's a competition they'll try and bring you down one way or another but the fact is that guy got in your head and ultimately made you feel like you'd done something wrong when you hadn't and the reality and it was is my fault. He's... it was my fault i shouldn't have let it affect me but that's ptsd no, but that, sometimes you can't stop it it shows that you're a better man than, than he is by not having to employ them tactics. Like, the fact of the matter is, he's probably going home, staying in his mum and dad's basement, and downloading illegal porn. Like, so you're one step ahead. <laughs> of Don't we all? Don't we all? <laughs> <laughs> nah, mate, I'll make it. It's easier. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Let's jump into you then. So, because, um, of course, I... Did you see any difference from what I was doing as a veteran coming onto the comedy circuit from the other guys you've met on the circuit? In the respects that you were come, you came from, you you come with material that is unique to you, unique to your story, your life, your circumstances. Everyone is different. Um, I I've gigged now with a few um, a few ex-services pretty much almost all Matt Lowe's thinking about it um and yeah everyone has their own different takes and whether or not you know someone's coming into it from having been a civ having been a civvy the whole life having been um in service having been you know one of the poor bastards that got their ass kicked up the arse every day at Disneyland we all come with our own shared, our own individual experiences, and we come to the stage to share them and share our viewpoints on them. Um, whether or not it's coming from service, coming from something else, as long as you're funny with it, that's the important thing. As long as you can say something that makes people 
laugh and also connect with you while you're doing it. That's the important thing. I, I've seen I've I've seen people come up with what would be wonderful material, but it's clear that it's not their story. It's not that yeah. it's, they've watched a TV show, they've seen someone do a bit and gone, I can write that better. And they may have actually written it better, but it's not theirs. And I I can generally read the bullshit off someone very quickly. If they come if they're coming to with a story and I can just go that's not you I, mm-hmm. I get it um because that's really like i but like, i came to like I, I jokingly say i fell into comedy through helping a friend stay alive um but i i, I went to i went to university trained as an actor i then spent nearly 15 years in um service industry working every type of bar I even actually ran a sergeant's mess for the army for six months, which was bloody hell. Yeah, that there's stories there, (laughs) but (laughs) no, I just I I take every I generally take everyone at face value until they prove to me that they're a (laughs) cunt. Yeah, fair enough, fair (laughs) enough. And I've got a lovely little story to share, especially for um, Gabe and Jamie. What has become quite a legendary joke of mine i actually ran past pip after a show one night i went i've just had this idea for a joke um we were sat and it, I'm, if i remember rightly it was after the bold forester which is a bit of a it's a bit of a challenging gig in itself well known um on the um silent comedy um uh, silent comedy list of gigs that they've got there and i went oh i've got a new gag about hawk and he went oh what's that then and i went how about I just turn around and go, can somebody explain to me why somebody gave me a golden retriever doing blackface? And <laughs> Pip nearly spat his beer across the fucking room. And I just went, I've got a gag. The, the second I saw Pip's reaction to that gag, I went, that's it. I know I've got a gag I'm going to be using now. I do like that one. And I'll say now, it wasn't beer, it was rum. And I, ha- I have a great... That's right. I have a great love for rum. So, yeah, nearly making me lose that says how good that joke was. <laughs> now, here's the next question I want to link into because of where you guys are on the circuit. You're far more experienced than me. Um, but it's the fact that you two are now running your own gigs. Um, Pip, what led you to decide you wanted to run your own gig? Um, for me, it was a little bit of I saw I found I found a venue which I looked at and went I could do something different here from where what everybody else is doing. Um, I run a I run a monthly show in effectively the back room of a pub, but it's only if I'm being generous, twenty people that can fit in there. And the mm-hmm. whole idea is we do a free show in a small venue so you can test your material. Because let's be honest, we've if you've got if you've got a decent sized pub, but only 20 people and they scatter themselves around, it's hard yeah. work. But you put those yeah. 20 people in a in a smaller space, it's a lot easier. Um, but yeah, I'm, f- I'm I'm regular at the pub. There was the opportunity. Um, Another comedian from the South Coast here was saying how he was wanting to get back into running shows and it just went click, click, click. I, I've always prided myself on being that sort of person that puts people together. And I was just like, you know what? Yeah, let's let's just do this. And hopefully we're currently talking in talks to a venue about running a pro show. So we'll have a second chance. Nice. Nice. I volunteer. I volunteer. I, I offer myself as tribute straight away to that one. And uh, and Pip and I will both know that the the Portsmouth Gosport Fairham circuit is very, very small. There, there are very few gigs for us to do. So any opportunity to see a new gig appear is always appreciated. George, what about you, mate? What made you decide that you were going to start running your own gigs? Um, because I was sick of seeing the same shit every single <laughs> week. Right? That too. Like, like I, I don't I, I don't care, I'll be honest, right? Like, people up here put their mates on and they're like, 
Okay, so here we have one of the best acts in the Northeast, and he's fucking diabolical, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, he's his mate, so he's like, yeah, yeah, we, we don't really know each other outside comedy, but they do, because they've gone to school together, and they're absolutely shit. So, <laughs> they're, they're, the sort of people, they're the sort of people that were running it, right? And they were getting like, oh, we've got the new act of the year competition where you'll get like, a twenty-five pound gift voucher for just eat if you win, and I was like, "Fuck that!" <laughs> I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put a night on and do it bigger than anybody else, and make sure that everybody gets a fair shot. Like, I don't care if I've got friends, right, that are good, I'll put them on. If I've got friends that are shit, I'll not put them on because the shit, and I'll put them on a smaller venue to get practice and then work up to a bigger venue, like what people have to do. Like, so I just thought I don't want to. I don't want to go with the grain. I want to go against it. So I'll start my own night. I'll put it on and I'll be unbiased to anyone. And if you're good at what you do, then you'll move up to the bigger venues like the theater. If you're not, then I'll help you and progress you through to the bigger venues, which is what comedy is all about. It's the same as the military, right? If you've got an officer that came in fresh out of university, didn't ever go, yeah. didn't have no sand in his boots, and then is telling you, right, this is how you run your troop. This is how you run your operation. You'd be like, shut up, mate. Six months ago, you were getting beans on, off toast, beans on toast with your mum and dad. And now you're trying to tell us how a 16-year serving sergeant has to, has to run his troop. So that's what the comedy industry where I live started to get like. And they were favouring the friends. So I thought, nah, mm -hmm. I'll just go bigger. So I approached the biggest venue in the northeast in Darlington, the theatre. And I was like... I'll put a comedy night on and it'll be better than anything you've ever had before. And it is so, and it's unbiased. And that's not me being like overly cocky. The reviews that we get from them comedy nights is amazing, but I won't put someone on that I used to go to school with just because I like them. So I broke the stigma and tried to help people to develop. And one lad came to his first gig was petrified, died on his ass. And then I went for a beer with him, sat with him the next week and said, listen, this is what I think we should do. And now on Wednesday, he's playing, playing a 300 seater and he's brilliant. Sweet. Uh, all right. So convince me, convince me. I live in, I live in Gosport, the shallowest gene pool on the South coast. Um, <laughs> there are no gigs in Gosport. There are no gigs in Gosport. So I'm, I'm sat here on my freezing little boat going, I need more gigs. Yeah. What would I need to do to set up a gig? What does it take to set up a gig? Go and fucking put one on. Do what I done, right? Go and buy a microphone from some second-hand shop, which is what I done, because I didn't want to buy anything fancy. Go and get a decent PA system. Go and get a microphone and get a banner made off Canva or Vistaprint and then call it Jay's Comedy Night or something and go to the biggest theatre and say, I will sell all of your seats in here within three months. And if not, then you don't have to book me and go and get someone else. And I guarantee you, if you put enough work in, like I'm sat here and out at my desk, I've got this ridiculously wide screen. I'm, sh I'm terrible with laptops and computers. But one side, I've got all my material for making posters. And the other side, I've got all my tickets and my way to promote my night. And I'm no like, I'm no Michael McIntyre or Lee Evans or anyone like that. But I've got drive and determination. And if you've got it, there's no reason you can't sell out any venue. I've never not sold out a venue ever in the time I've been doing it. I just had a very large squeaky bum moment because I've gigged with Pip. I've never played a room that big. The biggest I've ever played so far, well, th this is cheating. The biggest room I've played so far was South Coast Comedian of the Year. That was um, 120. I'm used to doing 20 seaters with Pip. So let's change it around Pip. For a small intimate gig like you, what does it take to set something like that up? One, the balls to go to a venue and go, give me the night. Yeah. Um, obviously, like with me, with um, the Phoenix where I run, I know them because I'm a regular there. I knew that the, I knew the space was dead. I knew nothing was happening those nights. So I just turned around and went, look, it's no cost to you. Let me come in. Let me have it for the night. I will bring people in. They will spend money. And sure enough, it bloody worked. So far, touch wood, if I could find then touch wood. Um, <laughs> we've only had one night, one night where it was pretty much just comedians. Mm -hmm. And there was a myriad of reasons for that happening. 
but mainly because I had been in Jersey for about two weeks before the gig and hadn't had any time to really do anything. But anyway, um, yeah, basically you just have to have the balls to turn around and go to a venue and go, I want your space. The other thing is have in your head a short list of people you want to do a gig with. Now, um, George will probably agree with me on this, having done this. It's all fair and well putting a thing up going, I've got slots. I've got 10 slots for a show in a month's time. But when I come, when it comes to me and I want to do a show, I generally, I had it in my head, like the very first show, I was like, right, I know who I want. Who do I enjoy doing gigs with? Your, your name was the first because I had you on my very first show. I got Nat in. I got, I got guys. I got guys and girls who I. Oh, the legend absolutely... that is Sam Jackson. Yes, Sam, ja Sam Samuel Jackson. L. Well, there is a guy on our local circuit called Samuel L. Jackson. He's a twenties. And promote it as a Hollywood act is coming to play at the gig. Doesn't matter. Oh, mate. Get him in. <laughs> Sam um... is Sam is beautiful. He's a very large twenty-something geography teacher. History. He is a history, history teacher. He is fucking genius. But, um, yeah, basically, though, that very first show, I put it to myself of, I'm going to book the people that I want to hear. Um, and then it wasn't so much booking my mates, it was booking people I knew could make, could make, be good. And, and that, and yeah, well, that as well. And that's what I've been trying to stick with. Um, <laughs> The one night when I did turn around and throw it out to everyone, it turned into a ball ache. And I ended up with the one time when I've wanted to walk up and gr just grab an act and throw them out the building. Um, wow, go on, go on. That's a story you need to share. Why? <laughs> Why as a booker did you want to chuck somebody out the building? Because he wasn't be So, okay, I've always said, and you've heard me say this a number of times, nothing is beyond a good joke. Yep. And I mean this, nothing is beyond a good joke. You know, just look at the current government. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but um, this guy comes in. Um, he's um, a Indian-Pakistan guy. I wasn't quite sure which it was. And he starts his whole thing off about colonialism and how the British have come in and stolen stuff and it's called a little colony. And I'm like, okay. He's telling his truth. I'll, I'll, I'll let him go. Telling his truth. Telling his truth. Telling his truth. At this point, we oh, we had um, there was two couples um in the audience, and he had decided he was going to do crowd work with a, and he got right in their face, basically turning around. God, how long have you been together? And like, oh, we've been together a couple of weeks. Ah, he's cheating on you already. Trust me, he's already doing it. He's already doing it. And I was like, Whoa. okay. Okay, you're 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 not you're not making a joke now. You're making accusations. He then goes into a very homophobic rant, and I don't say this as a snowflake. I say this as someone who is, um, I say this as someone who looks and goes, "No, mate, no, you're not making a you're not making a joke about your own personal view. You're making you're actually making a, a statement that it's wrong." Yeah. Yeah, and there's a very big part of you failed to read the fucking room <laughs> because I'm yeah. you, I'm the booker of this show, and you're telling me I'm wrong. Mm. You know, um, so we very quickly got him to wrap up, and after the show, after a show, as a booker, I always go around and I give everyone what I like to call their shit sandwich: good bit, dodgy yeah. bit good bit i just turned around looked at him and went thanks for coming bye <laughs> and I, we, we've spoken about this a load of times on project comedy there is nothing that you can't tell a joke about it's all down to your intent if your intent is to hurt or exclaim a view that is radical then it stops being a joke because that's the entire job of a comedian is to make people laugh if you're there to expose your you, you know, your agenda, suddenly you become a politician. You're no longer a, a comedian. You can joke about anything you want. Sometimes it'll burn you in the ass. 
my pronouns bit burnt me in the ass. I'll park that for a little bit. But it's it's what your intent is. Anything you would chip into that, George? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, going back to what you said about getting a venue, right? Like, there's two ways you can do it. So, one, you could go in and say, hi, I'm Jay. Um, I'm going to put a night... I, I'd like to put a night on fire and I'll charge nothing for you as a venue, but any ticket sales that I make will be mine, okay? And then you can take the wet sales, which is like the bar term, isn't it, for like making money mm-hmm, out of the drink, mm-hmm. which is always massive at a comedy night. That's how I started off. I first went in and said, right, I'll do it for free, but I'll take the ticket sales. Charge £2.50 a ticket just to get people in. Because if you do it free, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Because if you've got a free night, people might think, oh, well, I've not paid nothing. I'm not going to bother going. So you could go in and say, because every venue has got an entertainment budget, fact. So you could say, what's your entertainment budget? And they'll go, oh, we're not going to tell you. It's always about 200 quid, right? So if you say to them, well, you give me 200 pound for this comedy night and I'll put on six acts, right? You can then give each act 10 quid, right? And take some money for yourself to do the promotion and stuff like that. But it gives people a reason to want to come back. So if you do, all you need to do if you wanted to start a night is do one night and really, really work and promote it and get it out there and go knock it. I went in at Greg's me. Greg's the bakers and the woman that gives me sausage rolls. I was like, how are you doing, Shannon? Do you want to come to a, do you want to come to a comedy night? And she was like, uh, meh. I said, look, it's £2.50. Like, if you buy a ticket now, you can be there on Tuesday. And she bought one. So, like, you just got, yeah. uh, you've got the graft in and you get it. And then eventually, like, I'll walk into a venue now and I'll say, right, the, the big here is £400. And I'll give you a hell and I've got credit from I don't know, so you think you're funny or something like that. It just keeps smashing the circuit. Like, and we're on a podcast and we're recording now, but get on a mega bus and come up here to the northeast. Like, mm-hmm. I'll put you on. You've got a massive gap in the market. Like, people want comedy. Everything that's happened over the last couple of years, people are in really dark places. And if they could give for an hour or two hours and not feel like nothing, worry about the pressures of life and not worry about whether they can pay the bills or pay their electric and shit like that. People come and they'll enjoy it and it'll build you as a person and the comedian and the mind as well. That's, awesome. That's the great thing about comedy, isn't it? The escapism for yeah. an evening. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. A lady that came once and she was, I didn't know who she was, right? And she was in the crowd and I speak to the audience. I don't, I'll go in at them, right? And this lady was sat there and she was really, really up, like, just was not interested, arms folded. So I spoke to her, a bit of a crowd, I felt about her, had a laugh and a joke. She came up to me at the end of the night and she said, George, what you've done there was something that really resonated with me. Because at the end, I talk about the importance of men's mental health and how men should stick together and speak out if they've got a problem. And she lost her son three weeks before. And she came out to a comedy night because a friend told her to come. And she said, I would have never left the house. And even when I was sat there and you were talking, I wasn't involved in it and I wasn't accepting it. And then once you made me feel like part of the night, everything else that had gone on that week just disappeared. And so we're not we're not politicians. We're not changing the world. I'm doing that in inverted commas, but even though you can't yeah. see it, it was on the podcast. We're not changing the world specifically, but we're giving people an outlet. So if you can do that, you're doing your job. Do you know what I mean? Like that lady probably went home and probably cried and thought about her son for a little bit, but then she had a laugh and a joke at other people's expenses and at her expense. Cause I tortured her for about 20 minutes, to be honest with you. And she was like, she was giggling and laughing and feeling embarrassed, but it picked her up. And if you can do that in your area, then you're doing something for your community and you're doing something for the people around you. The same as all the lads that are on this record. Now, if I, if I rang one of you, even though I don't know you and I rang you and I said, Jay, I'm struggling here. I know you talk to me. And yeah. that's the way that, 100%. That's the way that, and all is, that's the way that comedy is now. Like I say Lord. at the end of every single gig, I say, look, if anyone's got a problem, you've got me on Facebook, send me a message and I could show you, you now have, on my phone. I've got hundreds of messages. You have just given me, you have just given me the perfect intro to our advert because I've said to the boys before, um, the most rewarding moments I've ever had on the circuit, because most of my routine is about having PTSD. Um, but the most report, uh, the most important moments for me being on the circuit is four times now I've been hugged by members of the audience going, it's the first time I've ever laughed about my PTSD. 
that suddenly really, really meant the world to me. So it's my perfect intro to just go, if you fancy having a go at stand-up comedy to see what it can do for your mental health, do for your recovery, just to increase your confidence and feel better, here's a few details on how you can end up joining Project Comedy. Would you like to join Project Comedy? The reality is, it couldn't be much simpler. All you have to do is get on the internet and find your way over to the Project Recce website. That's Project, yeah, the word Project Recce, as in R-E-C-C-E dot org, O-R-G. Have a look in the upper right hand corner, click on the menu and click on Project Comedy. Scroll down there a bit and you'll find a link that says apply now. That will send an email to one of our ambassadors. If you're even more bored, scroll down a little further and you'll actually see a couple of our ambassadors making tits of themselves on the stand-up comedy stage. Nonetheless, just click on the link, get in contact and you can be as funny as you want to be. We have mentioned on the podcast um, a legendary routine I've seen a few times, and that is yours, Pip, um, (laughs) talking about OnlyFans. Now, I know it's a bit, I know it's a bit, but for fuck's sake, mate, you've got to explain to everybody, where did the OnlyFans come from and what is the OnlyFans routine? Okay, so um, so it all started with lockdown. I was um, unemployed. Yeah. I was looking for work, and well, you know, when you're, you're you're unemployed and you're looking for work, you've got your laptop open, you've got your tab open with all the job searches, and you've got your tab open with the Pornhub on. Let's be brutally honest, guys. We've all done Ding it. Off. And it just struck to me, it's like, well, you know what? If I'm going to be here doing it anyway, I might as well turn the fucking camera on and make some money. You know. <laughs> um, sorry, that is a bit of the bit. But now, nah, um, it basically all came from, um, I have a reasonable following on TikTok and there is, a, and I know a lot of people on there who also do the whole OnlyFans thing. And um, through chatting with them, they, you know, I hear some of the horror stories. I get some of the really bad stuff. Um, and I have, you know, so I, I know people in those circles and it was just a case of okay, looking at it going, putting A, B, C and um, I, I won't lie, I looked at it, I made an account, there is an account, there's nothing in the account, but there is an account. Um, <laughs> he, he claims, he claims he's now looking for subscribers. <laughs> If I I keep saying I'm going to upload all my comedy sketches onto it, so when people do look it up, they'll find that. But anyway, <laughs> but anyways, um, but yeah, the the bit. So I'm, I'm guessing you're getting about the weird requ- the weird request bit. Yes. Okay. Um. So it's a little. So it is a bit of a mismatch of things. Yes, it actually happened. But it didn't happen on OnlyFans. Ding um, dong, carry on. It happened on an online dating um, profile. Really? Um, carry on. Yeah, um, basically, uh, I had someone contact me and ask me if I would be willing to come to their house, pick them up, and put them in the bin. <laughs> <laughs> and they would pay me a hundred quid to do it. Fucking hell. And I'll around there like a fucking shot. <laughs> Is that part of the <laughs> <laughs> at, at, which, run, run, run. at which point I'm turning around going, hang on. What? You want, yeah. Not, you, 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 yeah. Just walk in. Don't say a word. Pick me up. Put me in the bin. Walk out. <laughs> I will pay you a hundred quid. Now, I didn't fucking... The the bit is that I actually say, yes, I did it, and I go around every two weeks now, and 
I also will use that as a bit of a fuck you on anyone who's been a heckler or annoying because I'll actually pick them out as if it was them. But anyway, um, <laughs> the joke, the, the dumb thing is I didn't, I didn't actually do it because, well, how do I put this politely? <sighs> do you ever walk down the street and you see a bloke and your mental and you and your brain goes, it would not surprise me if I turn the news on and they and it goes. Police in search for local man seen outside children's playground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's normally how I'm described. <laughs> but this this guy just it, it, it he screamed that and I was just like mm, sketchy. Contacted some people I know to tell them and they went, Oh yeah, Jim, stay away from him. He's dodgy. Like, okay. We will be staying away from this one. But at the same time, I was like, this is too good. I have to use it. I have to make something out of it. Because most... uh, mate, when you did, when you did, it was um it was when we did the um Solent Comedy um gong show at the uh, Loft at Kings. Yep. And I, I want to talk about gong shows, but I it, it this was the bit that made it so special for me. Not only was it a funny gag. <laughs> Not only was it a funny gag, it was your reaction to what it actually led to in that gong show. Because I went up, I thought it was going to be all right. I lasted four and a half minutes and I get the another one bites the dust. I came off the stage. I was mentally destroyed. I was not prepared for how aggressive a gong night show can be. You got up, you told that story. You were stunned that you got the winner's bell, you had beaten the gong. You were more surprised that you had got to time than the audience were. It was the biggest laugh I got out of the night. We went, what do you mean I've got through? You should have thrown me off the fucking stage. I'm not allowed to be telling this stuff. Your reaction to actually beating the gong was not one of success. It was absolute surprise going why have you not booed me off the stage it was fucking amazing yeah um one of the reasons for that is i've done gong shows before and the last gong show i did was in manchester and it didn't go well i i managed to last but not because my material was good i managed to last because the entire show turned into me and six scousers having a battle of wits and as we all know Scousers aren't really generally armed when a battle of wits when there's six of them and they're on the lash. Project Comedy would like to state that people <laughs> from Liverpool are allowed to have a mental aptitude. We've already alienated our American audience, thanks to you, Gabriel Murphy. We are not trying to okay. do a Boris Johnson and tell everybody in Liverpool they're thick and stealers. No, 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 no. no. Also, I, not the Americans. What? Um, but yeah, basically... Th- I finished and these six scousers decided they were going to kick my head in. So I ended up having a rather large gentleman inform me that I had to leave. Um, I was in, I was in green room and you know, everyone's having a laugh and the guys are going, yeah, well done, mate. You did well, you did well. And all of a sudden it became night. I turned around and there is this seven foot tall man. I'm looking him dead in the chest and he goes, you need to go, mate. They want to kick your head in. Now I don't know about you. This could be because I'm from Portsmouth and surrounded by the navy. But when a seven foot you seven foot tall man says he's going to take you out the back, you just go, "Oh what, darling, <laughs> sweetheart? It's only gave you push back. Look over your shoulder and wink at him." <laughs> but it's it takes me into a point because George, you run um, a gong night, don't you? Um... I will be the next month is the one yeah, the really big one yeah. And it's horrendous. So I've sp- I've spoken about it before in the podcast, and I want to point out. I think now you guys correct me. You, you know this speaking as a veteran and as a comedian, so yeah, you know, a civvy comedian, you need to mentally prepare yourself for a gong show. It's a different kind of show. I love comedy for the recovery it gives me because I'm suddenly in command. But it's very different, a, a gong show, isn't it? I would strongly recommend anybody that's going through any form of mental health problems at the time never to apply for a gong show because it will fucking chew you up and spit you out and make you feel like you are the shittest comedian to ever grace God's green earth. Because yeah. it's not 
it's not a standard you got to minutes make us laugh if you don't laugh all well and good end of the night it's like you're uh, trying what you think is amazing and then after the minute and a half of the grace period three cards go up as a big gong or like a a trumpet and then you're off and yep. you cannot like you can't be like oh wait i've got something else like that's you done like you have to leave the stage immediately so it was, it was the bit that got me. It was the bit that got me. It, it, it terrified me because I was so used to getting up and doing my fives or my tens and what have you. And you're in charge when you're the comedian. You, know, you have the yeah, power. Yeah, yeah. But at a gong night, it is the audience are in power. And the way they get their kicks is to humiliate you. It's complete reversal yeah. of doing a standard gig night. Pip, would you agree with that? Yeah, you, know, um, you were a civvy on the circuit. D did you find a difference doing a gong show? Oh no, the gong show is a completely different creature. Because um, yeah, you basically your set is the grace period, but you have to make sure that they want to hear the next bit. At that point, your set is thirty seconds. And then you get another 30 seconds and then you get another 30 seconds. It is very much the, at least the way that I've always done gong shows when is you've got to, you've got to get it out there quickly, but at the same time, you don't want to blow, you don't want to blow your lot too quickly. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to be clean on this one. But, but, um, yeah. There's so many similar situations. <laughs> I'm not yeah. talking to give myself before. <laughs> Yeah, but basically, yeah. Um, but no, when when it comes to you write your material, and it's like if you get a heckler, you can always divert from your material. And yeah, th there's your five, there's your ten. Gong show, you're walking in to a hostile environment, and you have to treat it like it's a hostile environment. Um, and Sounds like my house. It, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Actually, there it is. There it is. Doing stand-up comedy is like going to a fam is like going to a family dinner. You know there's going to be some jokes, but everything's all right. A gong show is going to a family dinner at your fucking in-laws and you can't stand them. Yeah, that's true. Right? And I can't stand show, them. Well, you can't you got <laughs> a lot of comedians struggle with a gong show because a lot of people have stories that they like to build up. So, like for example, you can build a story. And go bloody bloody blah, blah, and then revert to it back at the end, and then people will be like, "Ah, I fucking only mentioned that three minutes ago." Yeah. With a gong show, you have to be like, "Boom, boom, boom, boom." Otherwise, people are just like, "E shit, card up, get off." That's it. Yeah. Yep. Here's here's a question for you guys then, because let's let's compare and contrast. You've both had your comedy careers the way you have. The three of us, myself, Gabe, and Jamie, we've had our careers in inverted commas via Project Comedy, thanks to Project Recce. Now, you know, we've almost had, you know, us guys, we've almost had pre-job training to enter the stand-up circuit. I, and you know, being brutally honest about it myself, if it weren't for the likes of Jay Sadegar or Laughing Horse, there is no way that I would be doing stand-up comedy now. I would never have got the benefits out of it um, because that, that was the joy of Jay. He didn't train us how to be funny. He trained us how to be comedians and prepared us for the circuit. Now, you guys, have you ever had any training to be a stand-up? And would you ever consider having stand-up training? And to balance that out, to other veterans listening to this circuit or other comedians listening to this podcast, would you recommend that they did get some training? Go on, Pip. I was going to let you go first, George. <laughs> um, but um, well, listen, for me, I never had training for stand-up comedy. Um, I've trained as an actor, um, as a perform as a performer generally. So I learned, you know, stage presence, mic, um, how to handle microphones, stuff like that. But not in the context of specifically for comedy. There were times when, like when. Jay, when you're going on about your methodology, my brain's just like, I can't even fathom that. I just, <laughs> I just I can't. <laughs> I just go, I just go up and talk about the dumb shit that's happened in my life, you know. Um, and people find it funny. But that's 
there were times when, yeah, I would, I personally think, yeah, I would go on a course if I could afford it, you know, um, I would, I would do it. I would. So I've, what I've ended up doing instead is just going to gigs and picking out and asking people for their honest feedback. Cause that was one thing I noticed very soon on lots of people didn't want to rock the boat, didn't want to piss anyone off. So they didn't give their honest feedback. And like I said, I have a process that I picked up um, from my very short lived wrestling career of the shit sandwich. You have the bread, which is good. Then you go into the what was absolutely terrible, which is the shit. And then you end yeah. with another good bit, which is the last bit of bread. Um, but no, I really think that the training, as far as I'm concerned, from what you guys have done, sounds amazing. The sort of the more practice, the what I've had, the training that I've had for being a, to be a performer was much more varied. Um, but it did teach me at least the basis of how to get on stage in front of people, how to handle microphones, stuff like that. That is something which I see countless times new comedians not knowing how to do. <laughs> what about you, George? Oh, God, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> go on, mate, go on. Ah, oh, fucking hell. Oh, well, here we go. Um, I honestly think, right, that it's a load of shit. Because <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that to sound like really bad, right? But like Pip touched on, nobody can teach you to be funny, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be able to do it yourself. So... If it was the difference between someone saying to me, George, there's £300 for a comedy course or there's £300 for your train tickets or your bus fare or your fuel to go and beat the circuit yourself and see what it's like, I would much rather spend £300 yeah. on going, travelling around and trying to see if my material landed because a lot of... Oh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I'm going to say it, right? You know when you joined the military and you went to the AFCO the Armed Forces Careers Office. Yeah. yeah. Oh, fucking hell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was full of people that never really quite made it in the military. But they were yeah. then telling you how to be in the military, right? <laughs> and they seemed like fucking heroes at the time. You were like, oh, my God, Dave, that's fucking 55 years old and 28 stone is telling me how to be a parachute regiment god, right? The <laughs> fact is, he didn't actually get to that stage himself. So they put yeah. him in the careers office because he's about to leave and now he's going to fill everyone else's head full of shit, right? That, to me, is how I feel about these comedy courses because if people were doing that good at comedy themselves, they wouldn't be charging £300 to teach somebody else how to be funny. So, and this, is, and this is why I get so excited and angry at the same time because I got into it through Laughing Horse, Jay Sodegar and Project Recce. And, and that's the joy of what we learned. It was never about how to be funny. It was all about how to be a comedian. That was the joy. And, and, and exactly as you said, George, 300 quid to do a course. This is not an advert for Laughing Horse. This is not an advert for Laughing Horse. Um, his beginner's course is 75 quid. Mm. And it is just a weekend of learning how to be a comedian how to get to funny fast. But more importantly, it gave us the confidence to get to the stage the first time. It but was see, never... That, that, is, that hasn't got an ulterior motive, right? So whatever that guy's doing it for is for a good reason, right? Whereas yeah. people capitalise on the fact of we'll charge you £350 to be a comedian and they're fucking shit themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Whereas the lad that's doing it is obviously wanting to do it for a real reason. So I've never heard of this laughing horse, right? But what I'm saying there is he's obviously doing it for the right reasons. So he's obviously mm -hmm. wanting to help people, which is good. Because what I was going to say then is the amount that he's charging isn't probably even going to cover his costs. So he's doing it for the right reasons. But there's so many of these places out here now that will charge you £500 to, te to teach you how to be funny in eight weeks. And it's bullshit. Didn't Jay say to us that he had done something like about four or five uh, comedy courses before he ever took to the stage. He did. And he was there going, they were all bollocks. One, yeah, they spent exactly. an entire day 
but they spent an entire day on how to hold a microphone. And so I'm like, <laughs> what's that got to do with fucking comedy? As long as they can hear you in a microphone, it doesn't matter if you hold it fucking upside down, up your ass, or behind your head. Like, as long as they can hear you, it's fine. So this guy, whoever he is, I've never met him. He sounds like a great guy. He is obviously doing it for the right reasons, but there is so many people out there that are trying to catfish people and saying, we'll charge you £500 to be funny, and it's bollocks. Would you guys, would you guys actually reckon, so obviously we aim our podcast at military veterans. We do get loads of other people uh, listening to this, comedians and what have you. Um, But would you recommend a military veteran, especially those military veterans that have got mental health disorders or psychiatric issues, would you recommend them giving stand up a go? Yeah. Yeah. um... Why? Because it's it's cheaper and better than any therapy that you pay fifty pounds an hour for. And that guy, <laughs> that, you, that guy that you've got, that guy that you've got there, that's obviously gone out of his way to help other people to get the confidence to go out on the stage, sounds like a fucking cracking guy. So I'll give him a shout. I would if I was starting again. Yeah, I I I unfortunately yeah, um, George managed to get the punchline before I could. I, anyone with any mental health stuff, I generally would recommend stand-up comedy because it is cheaper than fucking therapy and i would like i still remember when i was in a very bad place mentally they tried to put me in group therapy and it was a bad idea because they basically put me in a room they put me in a room with a captive audience and who were feeding me material the whole fucking time and i couldn't help but make fucking jokes (laughs) so i just went you know what screw it i'll just go stand on stage And let's be honest about it. Let's be honest about it. Us that are actually on the circuit. Have you actually met anybody on the circuit that doesn't have a mental health issue? (sighs) Never. (laughs) (laughs) I'd say it's a prerequisite for getting on stage. Oh, no, I would say I've met a few who won't admit it. But anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Who's this this, this lad that coached you? Because it'll be worth me telling the lads in the North East about him because he sounds like a decent sort of way to go in. Well, and this is what Project Comedy is all about. He is our mentor and our tutor. He's a gentleman yeah. called Jay Sodegar uh, yeah. with Laughing Horse Comedy. So if you know the free fest, so the way you can get do things like Edinburgh and Brighton on the cheapest rates, yeah. they invented the free fest, was Laughing Horse Comedy. Jay Sodegar is the guy that delivers the training. He does it in three courses, but the beginner's course will get you on the stage. Here is the big plug for Project Comedy. We love you, Jay. We love you so much. In Project Comedy, for any veteran that signs up with us, he's given us veterans in. So the key skills that will just get you over that confidence edge to get onto the stage. And you'll know that you're going to be able to get a laugh out of it. And this is the joy of us running Project Comedy. We have the green room. We will never let somebody go to the stage without them knowing their comedy is fun because they all rehearse in a room like we're doing at this precise moment in um, on Zoom and try it out with other veterans so they know that they actually get laughs. It is a community of veterans and Jay Sodegar and Laughing Horse and Project Recce, they made that all fucking happen. They're an amazing bunch of bastards. Well, it'd be worth getting them around this area because obviously I'm 10 minutes away from Catrick here, which is where all all of fucking them lot go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, <laughs> like, it'd be, it'd be worth getting it out there to the northeast for the lads that maybe have came out that need to hear about this Project Recce and Project Comedy. Yeah. So, if you... Send Isn't this the magic, that, though? Isn't yeah. this the magic, though? We've got Pip over in Portsmouth. We've got Gabe in Manchester. We've got Jamie in in Stoke. We've got you in Darlington. And this is already a network of people going, let's be funny. It's better to be funny than mad, sad and bad. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, no, no, you can you can keep on being bad, Gabe. We like you being bad. You need link to be it, the dark in, comedy. Because, uh, if you link it in, I'll share it on all of my social media because... I know well, I'll come to that in a second, mate. I will come to that in a second. Before we close out, though, before we close out, what is it you two boys get out of doing comedy? I mean, what, what are the personal rewards 
of doing stand up for you guys. Just because he's looking away from the camera at the moment, I'll leave him for a second. George, you've come from the services. You're actually doing it very well, running gigs and what have you. What are the personal rewards to you of doing stand up? It's a release. It's a release. It's a way to still get the adrenaline that you got in the military. And it's cheaper and much more safer than class A drugs. <laughs> Fucking right. <laughs> what about you, Pip? Oh, sex, drugs, rock and roll. <laughs> you know, all, all the stuff that, you know, I, I do on my OnlyFans. It's nice to take a break from it from time to time. Um... <laughs> <laughs> it reminds you, in, the second you said that, it reminds me of that joke by, uh, it's an old joke by Lee Mack. He said that um, he got into comedy for sex, drugs and rock and roll. But what he ended up with was it masturbation, <laughs> Benelin, and Billy Ray, Billy Ray Cyrus. Yeah, um, <laughs> funny enough. Yeah, but no, um, what I get what I get out of comedy is I've always enjoyed making people laugh. I've always enjoyed <laughs> entertaining people because um, I've. This might go back to when I was a kid, and I used to get beat. I used to get beat up, but if people are laughing then they're happy. If people are happy, then they're not doing dumb shit, either to you or to themselves or to other people. So I just see it as this is me making things better for people. <coughs> if, you're la if you're laughing at me and the dumb shit that's happened to me, you know, if you're laughing at me and the time I accidentally introduced myself as a blowjob to a woman in France, great. You're not, going to go, you're not going to go home and mm. hit your wife. Anything like that. I just think that everybody, everyone would be happier and better if they had a fucking laugh from time to time. Here's a loaded question for you boys, considering you're both bookers. You're both bookers. Um, what do you want to see out of a brand new act? Go on, Pip. <laughs> out of a brand new act, I want to see something I haven't seen already. That, that, that that's a given i think universally i want to see something i haven't seen already be it their take on something their delivery um or just the entire routine as a whole i want to see something i haven't seen before i want to see confidence on stage i also want to see humility in the person someone comes to me with those three things yep oh and obviously being funny <laughs> Oh, fucking hell. We've got to be funny as well. Yeah, sorry, man. <laughs> I've been letting you slide because I like your dog. <laughs> <laughs> you bastard. <laughs> well, he whips me all the time. It's great. <laughs> what about you, George? What do you look for out of a, a, a new act, a first-time comedian? Right. I just want to see somebody want to make a difference. I know that sounds corny as out, but whether it's for their own reasons or or for their own personal benefit or for the ben benefit of themselves in the future. I just want to see drive. I want to see somebody that gets up there and if they die on their ass, they go, okay, that was a bit of a mistake. Maybe I'll try and rewrite something. I don't care if they're not, if they're not the best comedian that's ever walked on the stage. I just want to see somebody that's got the determination and the drive that they all looked for when we were in the military. Because if somebody can go and say, right, I fucked up there. It wasn't the best thing ever, but I'm willing to try and learn at it. I'll give them all the opportunities that they can have in the world. They haven't got to have the best set. I've called people back that were not very good at all on the first set, and now they're doing the theatre. So as long as you've got the drive and you've got the passion to succeed, that's all I care about. Your jokes can be shite, but if you've got the drive to go on, then that's all that matters to me. I'm now going I'm to let the uh, my fellow ambassadors come in for a second and go guys after the discussion we've had this evening what are your takeaways from that i mean is it reinforcing what we've learned before our experiences is there anything that you've got as a takeaway that the you know, pip and jord have just given us this evening take away more than food <laughs> I, I i honestly i think it's uh i mean like everyone knows that i can i can procrastinate like no man's business could have I can always wank, really. Well, can but, we all? Uh, it's Send you a link really going to me gonna push me now to sort of to just start doing it again. 
And it's like where I've, where it was out there and it was easy enough to do it at the start. And then it's kind of tailed off because obviously I have to put a bit of effort in. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get out there and start doing it. And Jamie? It's really interesting to hear it as, as therapy because it is. And I, I, I've not really thought of it like that, but it, 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 it takes it takes you up and down in the in the space of five minutes, whereby as soon as the the MC announces your name, it's brown trousers time, which very, very, very quickly turns into the best feeling on the planet when you drop your first punchline and you get your first laugh. So it 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 it's brilliant. It's 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 unless you've been on stage and done it yourself, there's no real comparison no way to explain it um and even though it's only me my fourth gig um i say to jordan that my my first gig was was similar to yours um although i was a, a mixed acoustic night <laughs> so it was like a spoken word but even more poncy um, <laughs> Yeah, going from there, and with it only being my fourth gig, I've, I've 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 got so much more to learn. But every time you go on stage and you get to the end of the five, and and people actually clap you off the stage, you just think, wow! And and it's it's the fact that you've wrote material that have made people laugh. It's brilliant, absolutely fantastic. So yeah, I definitely see it as therapy, and and it's perfect for perfect for veterans. Um, because I suffer from imposter syndrome, yeah, and it's like somebody say, it's like somebody sitting on your shoulder, saying, "You're terrible, you're terrible," you know. So, just to just to flip flip him off and carry on, it 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 it, it just gets you through gets you through life, really. It's been an absolute brilliant evening, gents. I've really enjoyed every last second. But before we end up closing off the podcast, uh, promo time. I'll start off with you, Pip. Um, can you tell us gigs that we can come and see to and any social media channels we can follow you on? Okay, so my next gig that I am running is on um, the 14th, so Tuesday, the 14th, Valentine's Day, at the Phoenix Pub in Southsea, where um, the wonderful Mr. Jay Saunders will be on the bill along with a number of other comedians. Um, and that is a night that runs every second Tuesday of the month. It is a free show. We will do a hat. We'll pa pass the hat around um, at the show so everyone can get a little bit of something. Um, as far as finding us, um, if you look up Smoking Skulls Comedy um, into Facebook, you will find our Facebook page. Myself personally, probably the best place to find clips of my comedy would be my TikTok, which is the true pip. Um, I apologize for all the other stuff on there. <laughs> all the wanking. <laughs> <laughs> and how about you, George? Yeah, so my next big gig is the Majestic Theatre on the 8th of February. That's a pro liner. Um, that's in Darlington. And then I've got the 9th, the 24th, and the 25th of March. Uh, social media is Larry Comedy on Instagram and Facebook is Geordie Loz and my podcast which is released every week with another comedian and guests every month and no sorry every week is Even Steel Cracks so if you look at that on Spotify Amazon, Apple Music everything's on there um, we'll do a little collab I think Jay in the future something with you we would love to be there we would love to be there yeah. I, I, I'll be open and honest i've only listened to a couple of episodes i freaking love it i was laughing my tits off along with it <laughs> hopefully you guys have had a great night tonight um what can i say thanks to, J uh, to jamie gabe but most importantly our special guests of the guests of the evening uh pip and jordy for making this episode happen um hopefully Every listener will realise that giving stand-up a go is an amazing experience. And for us military veterans, especially us with psychiatric and mental health disorders, it's an amazing place to be. So what we'll do, we'll sign off the same way as we do every single time. 
we're going to finish you off by letting you find the links to how you can follow us, follow us on social media. And please, comment back to us, tweet us, give us a post. We really appreciate it. Until next time. If you want to see what we're actually like on stage, please have a look at our YouTube channel. Search for Project Comedy, Veterans Doing Stand-Up, and look for our black and white logo that's exactly the same as the one we use for this podcast. You can also now follow us on Twitter. We can be found at Proj Comedy. That's at P-R-O-J Comedy. And me, Jay Saunders. I can be found on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter if you look for Comic J Saunders. That's all one word with the letter J in the middle. Comic J Saunders. Thanks again to everyone that's taken part in this episode. Until next time. Thanks for listening to the Project Comedy Podcast. Please support our veterans as they continue their comedy journeys. To find out more, including gigs our veterans are doing, please search for the Project Comedy group on Facebook, where you'll also find links to Project Recce, the veterans charity that makes Project Comedy possible.